Good day, everyone, and a happy new year. <laughs> happy 2024, um, Chisom. It's a, I wish you soon. It's a wonderful, wonderful new year. And we yeah. thank we thank God for a new year. Hello, audience. Welcome to another episode of the Lanfrica Talks, our first episode of the year 2024. I'm your host, Chris. For those who are new, Lanfrica Talks is a show focused on amplifying diverse viewpoints around AI, technology, data, language. And we strive to cultivate an inclusive platform where diverse perspectives thrive. And in so doing, we aim to reshape the conversations to reflect a more equitable understanding of AI, technology, data, and language and their impact on our world. Today, we have our very first guest for the year 2024. We're so honored to have Chisom Paula Ogamba. Chisom is a social linguist, discourse analyst, feminist, and lecturer. She's a PhD researcher working on rape narratives. It's a very interesting discussion today. I will not spoil it for you. So we're very happy to have you, Chisom, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. So I am going to share my screen so that I'll you know, start presenting. But before that, I would like to say that I carried out this research a few years ago, maybe three years ago, and then it's still so relevant today because I don't know, did you did you see that expose on TB Joshua? Did you happen to see it? How you know he has been raping and doing this and doing that. Well, let's get into my presentation. So, like the topic here says Nigerian language habits and its intersection with the social dimensions of rape and victim silence. So um, how did I come up with this? Why am I so interested in this? And why did I decide to hinge my entire career on rape and rape narratives? Because, you know, whenever you decide to you know, go into something, you must honestly aim or actually aim to solve a social issue because you know, we exist in you know, this world and we're all trying to make it a better place and wherever, you know, whichever area you decide to make your niche, you have to make it work for the society. I know that the, you know, the issue of rape, you no, know, it's, it's a very painful one and it is, it is sad because it is something that keeps reoccurring. People have tried, psychologists, sociologists, Everybody is trying to find out why this is so, look for a way to curb it, look for a way to contain it. And yeah, it's a, it's, it's a gender issue because look at the statistics, you know, women are raped. The, the numbers are very high. So I, as a linguist or a social linguist, I decided to approach it from, you know, social linguistic perspective. So under social linguistics, we have you know, a lot of disciplines, a lot of theories, a lot of scholars. They've come out, they've said this, they've said that. And this is a study that I carried out in 2020. So in 2020, that, uh, that's three years after the hashtag MeToo campaign. Oh yeah, like I have here a critical narrative analysis. So here I collected um, first person narratives, like the victims themselves, they came out, they used social media. I was actually on YouTube, Busola Dakolo, where she gave her, you know, where she gave her interview and talked about how Pastor Biodrum rape, raped her when she was young, I think 17. And five other victims came out, you know, focused, said the same thing, that this same pastor raped them. So the, the, the thing is, you expect that, you know, everybody will say, oh my God, you are raped. Oh, let's, you know, let's come together and find uh, and maybe arrest this man or maybe persecute him, you know, as the law, you know, stipulates. But no, people are saying, oh, he's a pastor. He's a man of God. Oh, I do not believe you. Some people said, 
that she was the one that seduced, you know, the man, so many things. And and I saw all these, I saw all these play out. So people were like, oh, all the women came together because I think there were five women. So they all came together and they planned to speak against a man, the man of God. And this is end time prophecy. Now, why will you speak up against the man of God? So, so many things. And, and one day I was, you know, I missed all my studies. I, I, I came across Edward Sapia and Benjamin Wolf. Okay. So these two people, they, are, they, they were amazing in the field of linguistics. They have definitions of language, linguistics, you know, stemming back to 1929. So in 19, it's something, it's five, it's four, they came up with the Sapir-Wolfian hypothesis. So this Sapir-Wolfian hypothesis is basically hinged on the fact that every single thing we do, the way we think, the way we dress, everything we do in our society is highly dependent on the habits of our language, that's language habits. So I'm going to leave this screen and go to you know the next screen statement of my problem. I've already mentioned that the issue of rape and sexual abuse have been explored by different scholars. And um, WHO, they came out, they even said that 70% um, of, you know, um, said approximately one in three women will confront sexual violence in their lifetimes, with 70% having experienced the traumatic reality of rape or attempted rape. And then I went ahead to say this pervasive issue intertwined with rape, sexual abuse, and victim silence. It transcends time, affects diverse speech community, especially within the African context. So the central question which formed the base of this study is, how does a language, a society's language habit promote rape and victim silence? So I approached this um, problem of rape from the linguistic slash sociolinguistic dimension. And this study hopes to prefer some solutions to containing the issue. So background to my study, I talked about the 2017 hashtag Me Too campaign. It went viral. Women from all over the world, they were coming out, they were talking about, you know, themselves to come out and say, oh, this is what happened to me. Because it is not something that, you know, we have been able to see, you know, from birth, growing up in the past until 2017, it was huge. It was a very huge campaign. Scholars from all over the world, there's this scholar in Sweden, she even did her entire master's dissertation on the hashtag MeToo campaign. So scholars, you know, used this as um, an avenue to approach, you know, the whole rape, you know, discourse. Social media, social media has, you know, it has it has its advantages and disadvantages, but it's actually it's been a tool for, you know, it has basically eliminated, you know, third party third party um, the sex sector. You know, in the past, whenever something happens or maybe someone wants to report, you know, a rape case, we usually hear it in the news. You know, you have a news reporter talking about it or you see it in the newspaper. But with social media, something can happen to you and you come online, you can use Twitter, you can use YouTube, you can use Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, which is a very recent platform. You can come online and tell us and tell the world, this is what happened to me. And, and the very important thing with that is that we have in, in, in the realm of um, narratives, we have homodegetic and we have heterodegetic. So homodegetic is first person, okay? If someone comes out to share their story, there are certain linguistic pointers the person uses, you know, to elicit um, um, either uh, what's that word? You know, to feel sorry, like, oh, this is what happened to me. You are not, the person is not being, trying to be objective. Because we see most reporters, whenever they come out, that's in the heterology, that's, that's the third person. Most reporters, whenever they come out to, you know, give narratives, they try to be objective. Rape 
rape cases are not objective cases. People are being destroyed. Lives are being destroyed. Psyche mindsets are being destroyed by this issue of rape. So most, most reporters, they try to be subjective, you know, present a victim, present, they, they, they try, they, they, they infuse their bias when presenting these cases, which honestly, I, I do not have a problem with that because you know they are removed from the victims. But hearing it from the victims' perspectives, it's 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 better in a sense. It's it gives more it gives more validity to the story because they are not adding or removing it. Most of them are telling it as it is. So social media has been an amazing tool, and in the realm of language studies, linguistic studies, it has created an entirely new genre of literature to you know to analyze to deconstruct and and everything so this study was based on a 2019 homo it was 2019 that you know the victims came out to tell their stories and it is funny how it's not funny but it's actually funny how this is relevant five years later it is very 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 relevant because just a few weeks ago, we are still hearing of pastors raping and raping. And the other day I saw on Twitter where a video was posted of Pastor Chris saying, we should not criticize our pastors and we should leave it for God. And I'm like, hi, you're a human being. The fact that you're a pastor doesn't elevate you, doesn't remove you, or doesn't make you infallible. But that's what we have today. And everybody believes. I wasn't, in, I wasn't in Karl Marx, in Marxism. Karl Marx, Karl Marx called religion an opium, an opium. So here in Africa, here in Nigeria, we see it in its most purest form. You know when an opium is in its purest form? We see it very well here because it's like this opium has a hold on every single religious person. They've, they've, I don't know, I don't know if you mix, yes, they've removed humanity entirely, removed rationale. Nobody's being rational anymore. Everybody is, is, is trying to be religious and, and working as if they are under a spell, which is, you know, it's a very, it's a very sad thing. So here I have my second background to the study. It further um, explains or expatiates on the other um, spiral thing that we had in the other slide. So I have here, this study was carried out in 2020 after the release of Bukola Dakolo's interview with Jude on YouTube, which follows the ideology of the Me Too campaigns. The data I used for this study was the narratives. So narratives, you are in video, there were like, I think three narratives I picked, I purposively picked two. Bukola's was two hours long, the other one same, one hour, 30 minutes, I think. So I had to transcribe them to written narratives break them into exchanges you know in a discourse rank scale you have your acts your move your exchange your transaction and your lessons so i divided them into exchanges and i tried to elicit various markers and you know um um habits language habits that were inherent in those narratives to further back up my claim that these language habits they actually play a role in sustaining rape culture in Nigeria. So I hear I explained language. I also talked about how Sapia explained language too. He said Sapia 1929 posits that language is a tool to observe problems and give real life solutions. It helps one report and understand what is happening in the society. And it also determines how a person views the world. So an individual interprets different actions and events based on the language features or personalities of that individual speech community. So Nigeria as a whole is a speech community. Nigeria as a whole. So in that speech community, we have one language. I know that our one language has you know, a lot of other varieties, but we have one language basically. So in that one Nigerian language, we have habits like religion, use of titles, all cultural norms and all those things and how all those things actually play a role in the kind of 
the kind of behaviors you know our language um, exhibits our language has a personality if you come on social media and, and you see a nigerian tweeting you'll be like oh this is a nigerian that tweeted so it is actually very um very obvious and we see that people from different countries when they are tweeting you see the differences whenever you see a nigeria come when, when nigeria comes out to speak there's a difference and that, and that's and that, it's not just in the way the person uses words is the ideology what's the person saying for example um you see when someone says oh this footballer did this people from other countries are coming to say oh this is wrong and you see someone from nigeria the person will come out and say is the woman that is lying or something it, it is it plays out in real time and i've seen a lot of examples you know post this my study and i was like huh as even I did this study now, I would have had a lot of things to add to it. So this is, you know, it's a problem because it's not just one person. We have majority of people exhibiting this same, you know, the same behavior or saying the same thing. That's how we that have like a term, oh, a Nigerian never has anything right to say, or a Nigerian man, oh, this person is from Nigeria. So like so many things, it's, it's a thing if you, you know, go through it. So theoretical underpinning so here I, like, I, like i earlier mentioned the sapir wolfian hypothesis of language relativism so this explores the interconnectivity between language and culture and says this interconnectivity brings out brings out the language habits so, or mix you know or yeah mix um, the language habits so whatever exists whenever language and culture comes together is what we call language habits and they also mentioned that you cannot really remove or separate language from culture language is culture culture is language so this is basically what the entire study was based off of the sapir um hypothesis of language relativism so here i talked about um how in 1929 sapir um and his contemporary wolf well, how they assert that an individual's world is structured by the language of their speech community, their social reality, mindset, archetype, experiences, and other elements that constitutes an individual's existence is controlled by the language they speak. Thus, language shapes culture, which in turn connotes the ideologies, beliefs, and norms of the members and practitioners of the language. So furthermore, I brought out Halliday. Halliday is is a favorite of mine. He's a structural is yeah structurally no, he's a functionalist. He he's like the opposite of Chomsky. Halliday is a functionalist. He he looks at language from the function you know part. Looks at language from the society. He looks at language from context. He's the person that diversified language studies basically because you know if you look at the the three, the three of language development after Chomsky and his whole uh, formalist approach, you see Halliday and how he basically said, let's stop looking at language as, you know, as, as an abstract entity. Let's look at it from, you know, from the point of the people who use the language, which is, which is a very, you know, good thing and revolutionary thing he did because it's it diversified language studies. So Halliday 1970s approach to the study of language denotes performance and explores how language is used by the interlocutors in the society. So this embodies the sociolo sociology of language. It was also explored by Heinz in 1970 in his theory of sociology of language, which constitutes of issues such as the issue of language and the social class, relationship between language and culture, language and occupation, and language and gender, which is another important you know, factor in this study. So the next slide is still about Sapir-Wolfian hypothesis, and I, I explained more on what it says. So I'm going to skip that because I feel like I've talked a lot about it. But that's basically my theoretical, you know, underpinning so language habits so what are these you know language habits so in their bid to 
explain the relationship between language and the interpretation of social reality. So they posit like five language habits. One, language is a huge, huge, huge connects connects to culture in a very huge way. So it's it's engenders our thought processes, our thinking about social problems and everything. It conditions our worldview. Different speakers view the world along different lines laid down by their different respective languages. I mentioned this earlier. So whatever you are seeing or hearing, you're interpreting it based on, you know, language habits in your head. So that is, that is what this one is talking about. Also talked about how our community, different, we live in different speech communities because of the different languages we speak and the large world, the, the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built up on the language habits of the group. So here in this number five, this is actually one of the most important habits that I explored in this narrative. So, so these elements are related to the Nigerian society in the use of titles and kingship terms. So for this study, I focused on the term father and the title pastor. So this was gotten from you 2010, just George you in his textbook 2010. So language habits here, I have Nigerian language habits actually. So I have Nigerian culture, we have proverbs, adages, religion, and we have kinship terms. So religion, like I earlier mentioned, it's for we here in Nigeria, it's an opium. It is no longer, it is, seven, it is actually constituting a nuisance. It is for women, basically more harm than good. Because why will, why will someone come out and tell you that, because in that narrative, when Pusola was you know, giving her narrative, she said that after Jodu raped her on a Saturday morning, she went to church or their fellowship on Monday. I was talking about how, as he's a pastor, all his sins have been washed away by the grace of God. And everybody was nodding. How does that make sense? When Busola told the mom that, oh, this is what happened. At first, they didn't believe her. They didn't believe her. When they finally did, and they went to, they, they took her to the, to the church and everything, everybody was trying to be so low-key. Oh, yeah, you apologize. Oh, yeah, you apologize. What did they, they, they arrest him? They didn't take him in, nothing. They just told me I apologize. And that was the way he went. That was the way he went, apologize. And he didn't rape her just once, he raped her twice. And it was just apology. And when, before Busola came out to finally tell her story, like um, a, a lot of people are coming out to talk because she's a woman. Women will come out because we have, a, we have proverbs or adages or like, Whatever, I decided like women are supposed to be seen, not heard. We even use words like when, when you hear someone was raped or you know, she was defiled. Why do we use such words? What, what, what um, such terms, what do they portray? What, what's the social semantic import of such words on the victim? Because we see that whenever um, a victim comes and I say, oh, this is what happened, this is what happened to me, especially the person is in a place of power. Most times, these men are in places of power. And, you, and we all see how it plays out. We men, men are like, who blame the victim. They first of all ask you, what were you wearing? And they will say, oh, leave, um, don't touch not my anointed. That's that in the Bible, touch not my anointed. That we should leave it for God. So the, the, the pastors should keep on doing whatever it is. So all those terms, all those, they have a way of, of structuring mindset. So imagine if you grew up and you're hearing a woman who was raped has been defiled. You're hearing, touch not my anointed. You're hearing, man of God is this. You know, they elevate them. You know, on, on, in, in social classes, I know we have the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class. But even if a pastor exists in the middle class, he's still a class above his, you know, congregation. They elevate men, they, these men, based on titles. Oh, he's a pastor. Oh, that means he's closer to God. 
sense of religion. You know, you did this in semantics, you do senses, you do references. So in that sense of religion, you have elevated the man because he's a pastor, because he has that title of pastor. And then most of these pastors are called daddy, father. Whenever you, call him, whenever you call someone your father, that word father, what does it connote? It connotes sense of safety. It connotes um, someone who is your guardian, who is supposed to, to help, who's supposed to be, you know, in a very cordial or kinship, you know. So whenever you accord that term to, to a stranger who is not your father, who did not contribute in any way biologically to make you, what are you doing? Your, your, what, what is it? How is it? Um, how is it registering in your mind? How is it structuring how you behave around this person? So you're relaxed. If you if you read the narratives, you you find out that these um, victims they are calling him oh daddy or oh pastor. They had a, the second person said she had a very cordial. She saw him as a father. She saw him as a father. That is why when he calls you, oh, come to my house this morning, you go because you do not expect your father to rape you. So because she saw him as a father, the second victim, she went and he raped her. So we have words that, you know, that have some socio-semantic imports that only exist here in Nigeria. And one of my recommendations is that we should actually review those terms. We should remove those uh, 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 stop calling your pastor's father and daddy. Stop, stop according, stop according uh, um, um, elevated status to, to pastors because they are pastors. They are human beings. They are, they, have, they are not infallible. They are fallible. So religion, we see it play out a lot. You see it play out very well. If you, if you go to, if you, if you explore Karl Marx and what he has said about religion, you find out that he actually was right. It's it's opium in its pure and purest form. So, so here the third one I have kinship terms. I talked about father and daddy, which you know I, I'll keep saying it, I'll keep you know hitting it because when even when this um TB Joshua, how will you ah daddy, how will you say that daddy did this? So even my father is not infallible. How will you say that daddy these people are men and they can do and undo. I'm sorry. So, like this is this is what we see is how language plays out. It, it structures your mind. It structures your mind because you know, um, um uh Chomsky said we are born tabula rasa, right? Mostly we say we are born tabula rasa. So who you are eventually, how you view the world, what you think, you say, oh, this is this and that is that, because language is arbitrary. Is based off of conventions. If a group of people come out and say, oh, this is what it is, that is what it is. Because, you know, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between something and what it stands for. So it is a convention. So imagine, you know, when you're born, empty tabula rasa, and then the totality of your experiences, of the norms, of the society, that is what makes up what you have in your head. It's not when you grow up or when you get to a certain age, you now start deconstructing, you start removing, minusing, plusing, oh, let's add this, let's remove this. So imagine growing up and you keep hearing these things hammered into your head, that is what you believe, you know, that is what, that is your reality, that is your social reality. So your social reality is that if a man, if a pastor rapes you, you cannot come out and say, this pastor raped me. Because your language habit has engendered that social reality. You cannot come out and say he raped you. Because in your mind, you grew up in a speech community where pastors are infallible, which is wrong. You grew up in a society where if you call out the man of God, instead of the blame to be on the man of God, it falls to you. You grew up in a society where these men of God are called daddy and father. And you're calling them daddy and father, according to them all those you know social connotations of that word. And because you do that, you 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 have like a sense of safety around them, which is not true. These men do not even have the right intentions. Most of them are not even called by God. The church, uh, 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 what do they call it? Institution in Nigeria is basically it's a business. It's it's to me. I don't know if I'm being judgy, but that's not what it is to me. 
So that is what, you know, this the title of this particular slide is Nigerian language habits. And all these engender our language habits. So I also talked about how the social, the social reality or social dimension of rape and culture, the intersection of both. I talked about hegemonic power relations. I've said it because the power, the imbalance is there. You know, when, when, you, when you hear feminists, they're like, ah, feminists, feminists. We are fighting for what? Just equality. Because there is a hegemonic power imbalance where, because we exist in a patriarchal society. So a man will come out and say no, and his no is believed over a woman's yes, even if she presents evidence. We've seen it play out. The numbers are there. So all these things, they, they, they bring about so many things. When, when, when men view women as tools for sexual gratification, where men view women as, you know, like there's, this, there's this study by somebody, O'Hara, when she talked about how rape is a gender issue, how men view women. No matter what a woman is wearing, you do not have the rights. Well, because we exist in a patriarchal society, like, why would she wear this? She's out to seduce me. A woman's world just you 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 do not a woman's world does not evolve around a man, which is something we need to do away with. Women are fully their autonomous beings. They have you know the right to do whatever it is they want to do, same as the men. There should not be disparities based on gender. If the only thing we have as difference is that a woman can you know give birth, she has all those reproductive organs. And a man cannot. That is the only difference. Ability-wise, every other thing is supposed to be on equal footing. So why do we say, oh, because of you're a man, we are according you something? Or like, I, I do not I have never gotten it, and I don't think I ever will. So because of this hegemonic power relations or power imbalance due to patriarchy, we have misogyny, we have victim silence. Just because in 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 that in that narrative. After the pastor had raped her that morning, she couldn't tell anybody. She just went to her room. She felt dirty. She felt she felt robbed of everything. Because as, 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 according to her, she had never had sex with a man before then. So her first sexual experience was a violent one by her pastor. And it didn't happen once. It happened twice in one week. And the man came out every morning, he'll come out and be preaching in fellowship. He didn't just do it to one woman. He did it to... And then when finally this news broke out, because I, I don't like looking at just one side, because I'm a social linguist, I look at society, I look at reaction. I, 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 that's why I love this theory of reader response. I, although I didn't use it here, but um, the, the critical um, sex analysis, it, it helps you deconstruct norms. So when you look at the reactions, to that particular narrative, I was I was not happy. I saw things like someone said, "Oh, she wants money." Another person said, "Ah, she was young. Ah, she's a pro she was a prostitute. I'm sure she was going to shake me ash for the father and for the for the pastor." As a lot of things were said, you actually do not want to see you do. Ah, someone said, "Why will you call it twenty years later? No matter if it may be hundred years later, when a victim is ready, a victim is ready because." What made her stay silent in the first in the first place? Who made her stay silent? Who made her stay silent in the first place? Is it's because of the kind of society we exist in, which is engendered by language. All those things you say, words you use, the, the, the assistance. Yeah, one of the, the recommendation I gave was that we should not institutionalize some misogynistic terms or adages. A young girl at 17 could not come out and tell you that a pastor raped her. Why? Because they'll tell you, because maybe she said she, she was religious, she was a Christian. Touch not my anointed. I think I went to, when I went to Redeem Camp one day, I saw it as a poster. Um, um, the grace of God covers all sins. It is a lie. It is a lie. So this is what this slide is about. So the next slide 
is to do my theoretical framework. So after my, you know, in the course of my analysis, I found out that, you know, uh, we have, there's, there was, there's an interplay, I think in 2014, um, so Tomanin um, tried, you know, he mixed um, critical discourse analysis and narrative analysis, but this was used in psychology, in psychological studies in psychology. So I decided to do my own, you know, for linguistic studies and I actually published it, it's online, it's on academia, it's everywhere. So I, I mixed or I, I did like a data play between the Ladovian technique for thematic progression in narrative and um, um, normal fair clause, um, dimension for three, dimension for critical analysis. So I mixed two of them and I formed a framework. I created a framework for critical narrative analysis in linguistics. So you, you do like, it allows you to bring in a lot of theories. I think I used cohesion. I used um, Delheim speaking acronym. I used um, Sapir-Wolfian hypothesis and also used Labov, Labov's um, technique for thematic progression in a narrative. I used all of them to deconstruct these narratives, to bring out these language habits, to analyze them and, you know, to perform my own, you know, recommendations. So it was it was an in depth study. It was a very, you know, in depth um, study. I tried to do a holistic study of these narratives. So these are the language habits I came across. We have institutionalization of misogynistic proverbs slash adages. We have the Nigerian social semantic import of religious titles. I have talked about that. And we have the Nigerian social semantic import of some kinship terms. So these are the language habits that, you know, that we are embedded in those narratives. So in my findings, I have Nigerian speech community, in Nigerian speech community, the semantic extension of the kinship term father and dad. You know, semantic extension is when you extend the meaning of a term to cover, you know, other concepts. So in Nigerian speech community, the semantic expression um, extension of the kinship term father and daddy to mean older males in position of power and authority and religious leaders. Because recently I even did like a Twitter poll and to find out oh, who are those that call their, fa their pastors father and daddy. And a number of them, it was there. I have them there on Twitter. People even keep on, you know, um, saying it. Stop calling these people father. Stop calling them daddy. So that when you want to call them out, you call them out. Most people in Nigerian society grew up afraid of their fathers. They grew up, you know, respect, extreme respect. They cannot call them out and do something wrong. A father is wrong, but cannot say it. And that is what plays out when you extend the meaning of this word to people who are not your father and your daddy. They will do something to you. You cannot say it. You'll be safe around them. So it it's plays out a lot. You know, it's it, the mind is a very funny place. This um this um psychologist um was Freud. Freud talked about it. Freud, Sigmund Freud, he talked about it. He talked about so many things. So everything you're doing is there in your head. If you do psychoanalytical um criticism, you find out how all these things get they 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 in your head. But well, you don't know they're playing out. Your subconscious is you know, you don't know they're playing, you don't know they're in your head. They keep on playing out and you have no idea. Your subconscious leads you, but you don't know. So the kinship terms, father and daddy, connote safety and in most cases, worship, fear or extreme respect. This plays a role as indicated in the narratives where the victims felt safe in their company and didn't expect to be raped by them. Even when they were not raped by them, they couldn't call them out because at first you won't even realize what happened. Your question, did this happen? Did it not happen? Okay. When you now realize that it happened, you now just question it. Should I call them out? Oh, but his daddy. Oh, but his father. Oh, who will believe me? He's a pastor. The pastor will come out and say, it did not happen and the whole world will believe him. An entire documentary came out about T.B. Joshua and we had people saying, no matter what people say about him, he's my, how he passed off, he's my pastor. You cannot change the fact that he was my pastor. Some people came out and said, oh, uh, and he knew it was going to happen because he said, oh, my people would betray, my apostles would betray a man, a human being, like me and you. Ha! 
have never seen this kind of the opium ah, is holding us. What people say, oh, Gianyeji, it is holding us. So, the third one religious based class stratification, where the religious leaders, pastors are seen as above the others and therefore have direct access to God or anointed and should not be touched or criticized, leaving them to run around unchecked. Because these people are running, that, that, that's what, that is what this particular finding is what I got when I explored the responses of the people, of society. Even when the, even when, because they went to court and they really came out and said, and the ruling was like, it has um, expired, the statute of limitations has, you know, expired or what, I don't know what the word has passed. People still came out and said that the court said that is a lie. Because you do you don't want to accept in their head that is the past the, the man of God, their father, their daddy, pastor, raped. So these are these are the things. These people are I have the video of Pastor Chris saying uh, uh, a religious that should not be um criticized. As how? Why are we according such send sheep to them when they are still human beings living on earth with us. So I also mentioned that institutionalization of allergies like a woman should be seen, not heard. That one of the findings I came across. Also, purity culture. I'm against purity culture in all its forms. I, I, in this, I explored this in the use of terms like defiled. Defiled, what does that word mean? Why do we keep using it for women who have been raped? defiled does it mean she's no longer whole does it mean something is missing from her there are so many things that you know words we use if you look at words terms what do they mean what 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 is the psychological and social uh, 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 imports of such words especially when you use them on victims so these are my findings and the next slide I have, I have recommendation. As always, I'm always saying we should eschew patri patriarchy. We are not using it for anything. That's led us nowhere. Patriarchy has led us nowhere. So I also said we should review, you know, the meaning and the use of some linguistic terms like defiled and, and uh, the use of pastor, use of father. And, you know, use is just not how we use them. It's, encompasses everything surrounding that particular word. So we should have them reviewed. I also mentioned that religious leaders are humans and are fallible. Therefore, they should not, they should be treated as such. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, Chisom. That was truly, truly one of a kind. Like like I I observed in the